Welcome back to Close Up. We officially have a general election governor's race on our hands, and we're going to check in with both the incumbent and the Democratic challenger this morning. Governor Chris Sununu is up first. Thanks for joining us, Governor. Thank you. So before we get into the questions, Governor, just share with us some of your thoughts about Governor Steve Merrill, who passed away this last week. Well, Steve Merrill was, uh, I think a lot of people would agree, uh, an incredible public servant, set a stage and a tone for the state in terms of just putting people first, putting that individual first. He had an amazing way uh, of really kind of categorizing some of the complexities in government at a, to a very simplified level. He coined the New Hampshire advantage with no bribe-based taxes, limited government, local control, uh, and he was just a people's governor. And so today is really a celebration uh, of his public service, of his life, and kind of a, a reminder, I think, of how to do it right. Just an amazing communicator. Uh, but Governor, let's now turn to the pandemic. We just had a COVID cluster event on the UNH campus. How many more chances do these young people get? Is it a three strikes and you're out situation? How many more times can they do something like this before it's prudent to start scaling back on campus? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a, a three strikes in your out type situation. I think we know we're going to have to be in a constant management position, not just with UNH, but with all the different universities, public and private, making sure that they their plans, which are good, we've really looked at them, Dr. Chan has approved them, uh, that they're being managed too. And the students understand uh, those expectations, what's in those plans, the expectations, and frankly, the consequences as well. And, and there will unfortunately have to be consequences because it isn't just a, a single party or a single event. It really is uh, and can it be a domino effect, if you will. One small event can trigger a lot of other things when it comes to the, the spread of this virus, the very aggressive attack rate that this virus has. So we know that it can be very dangerous. And again, I think it's really just incumbent upon us to keep pushing that message, make sure folks understand what the expectations are. You got to make sacrifices. We have to do things a little bit differently. Uh, whether you're 5, 15 uh, in college or, or retired, um, everybody has a role to play in the success in terms of managing the virus going forward. I know you've said you don't want to play the role of the mask police. I'm not sure that's a job anybody really wants, but I've got to ask you this. At the GOP Unity event this last Thursday, you were photographed with the entire Republican ticket with your masks off. You were indoors. I know we've seen outdoors has been okay over the last few months in the summer, but indoors seems to have an added danger to it. So aside from the public health aspect, why even take that risk with the Republican ticket? Well, I have to say that event, I mean, folks were wearing their masks. They were doing, I think, a very, very good job. Um, there were some of us having a coffee and, and at the very end, they said, all right, hop on stage. And so we hop on stage, we, we did a photo and then we kind of moved off. So um, I think the folks at that event took the masking very seriously. They were making their announcements. People were doing the right thing. Uh, but a bunch of folks just wanted to take a quick picture and we did. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you look at the, the requirements and what we're looking at in terms of wearing a mask, maintaining a social distancing, you know, being in contact with folks for dur longer duration and periods of time. So look, having a cup of coffee and, and taking a quick photo with somebody I don't think really defines in terms of where we're going with masking. We want to keep that that uh, level of um, importance up in terms of what it is and where you are. And, you know, uh, if you're in large crowds for long periods of time, none of that has changed by any means. And I think New Hampshire's done a great job with that. I think the people of the state have done a great job with that. Uh, I and mean, if we keep that up, I think we're going to be in a good management position through the fall, uh, get to 2021 and put 2020 behind us. If Joe Biden wins and becomes president in January and then attempts to institute some kind of national lockdown along the lines that some other countries did earlier this year, are you going to go along with that? Uh, well, if look, if there were a national ma mask mandate, as long as it's legal and constitutional, then we, we're going to follow the law. I'm a big believer that you, you play by the rules. Uh, we're going to follow the law if, if that were to, to come into place. Again, I think New Hampshire has done a great job with masks, with social distancing, understanding the, re the responsibility of it, and we have the results to show it. Right, the fact that we have one of the lowest COVID uh, infection rates in the country, we have one of the strongest economies in the country, we have guidance documents for each of our businesses and industries, we've made restrictions where, where we've had to. I can tell you New Hampshire, I think, has been a model for the rest of the country uh, in doing it very, very well. Uh, we don't have a statewide mask mandate here, but of course, if something nationally were to come and that's if it were you know, a law or whatever it might be, then we're always gonna play by the rules. Let's get to that one-on-one -on -one matchup with the Democratic challenger, Dan Feltis. One of the big points of contention in this race, as it was in 2018, will be paid family and medical leave. He says it's disingenuous for you and Republicans to call his uh, premium on wages the funding mechanism for his plan an income tax. How do you respond to that? Look, Dan Feltis wrote the bill that actually says payments shall equal 0.5% of wages for each employee. Th those are his words, not mine. I vetoed that. Um, I don't care whether you call it an insurance premium or an income tax or a flock of seagulls, right? The words say the payment shall be 0.5% of each of the wages of each employee. 
I mean, go look at the bill. So, you know, it's, his version was an income tax. I put forth a paid family leave plan because I believe it, I, I in it, I know it can be done, and it was a choice. People could buy into the program or choose not to. His plan said everyone has to buy in, and the state would become the insurance company. That's the, he tries to call it an insurance premium, but he's making the state the insurance company, and you have no choice. When you and I pay our insurance premiums, if we don't like the premiums, we can try another insurance company or whatever it might be. It's choice. There's no choice when it comes to the government demanding 0.5% out of your out of your wages. Again, those are his words, not mine. It's clearly an income tax. Everybody understands that, um, and uh, and I think you know that's that really defines where they're going. Big government, right? More taxes. When when people and citizens and businesses are struggling economically, the last thing you should be doing is demanding more money out of their pockets. It makes no sense. It's it's lazy management. And management is what this state needs. And management is why we've been so successful. Dan Feltes has no management experience in his entire career, none. But he's going to come in and manage the biggest crisis the state has ever had, the biggest economic responsibilities we've ever had. We've set the gold standard for this country when it comes to managing the crisis and the economy and jobs and keeping people safe in their communities and their homes. We're doing an incredible job here. And I think that's why we're going to be successful in November. Going back to the Democratic primary debate, Senator Feltis said he would commute to the death sentence of Michael Addison, who killed a Manchester police officer in 2006. That essentially invites a petition to the executive council. What are you going to do if something like that comes forward? The fact that Dan Feltis is out there saying he wants to commute the sentence of a cop killer, someone who assassinated, murdered a cop in cold blood, um, that is on that is is up for the death penalty, and frankly deserves the death penalty. I stand with law enforcement. I stand with the citizens of Manchester. I stand with the citizens of the state who say that commuting the death sentence of a cop killer is the absolute wrong thing to do. Dan Feltis is out there being supported by people like Tom Steyer, uh, his campaign, who is the number one funder of the defund the police movement in this country. That's the mentality of the individual running against me for governor. And that will not keep us safe. That will not keep our communities and our homes and our streets safe by any means. So again, I, I think it's it's deplorable that he would commute the sentence of this individual. I think it's deplorable that he's taking support from people that wanted to fund the police across the country. And it's the absolute wrong direction in terms of where the state needs to go. Another policy area on which you've clashed with Senator Feltis is green energy. There's been some consensus around expanding net metering. You speak often, though, about individual liberty, uh, expanding the empowerment of individuals over systems. Why can't more people be free to generate their own power in New Hampshire and also with schools and municipalities? Why shouldn't they be able to generate as much power as they possibly can with solar? Because it's not free. Because the net metering bill that was that the Democrats put on my desk costs over the next 10 years about $200 million. That comes out of your energy rates. That's a tax within your energy bills. Everybody has to pay that. In fact, it's a regressive tax in that the folks that get hit the hardest, low-income individuals, families that are struggling, they turn on the lights as much as any, anybody else does, and they get billed for that. My strategy when it comes to solar is to say, okay, let's push solar power, but make sure that those panels end up on the rooftops and in the homes and on the apartment buildings of low-income families, right, of the mobile home parks, of those that are struggling the most to pay their bills, they should be the first at the table to reap the economic benefits, not these giant developers. Net metering essentially creates 10, 20 acres at a time of these giant solar fields that are owned by these big development companies. They get all the benefits, and we pay the bills. It ain't free. So there's a strategy and an implementation to move forward, kind of like what we're doing with wind power, right? I've been a big champion of offshore wind in the state. I think that could be a, a huge boon in future for our, uh, to be more resourceful in terms of our energy mix. Um, and when it comes to solar, there's more that we can do, but let's make sure that the low income families are the first at the table to get those economic benefits, not the big solar developers that want to build these massive, you know, essentially power grids, if you will, that uh, benefit themselves economically. We got to pay for it. Governor Sununu, thanks for joining us on Close Up. We'll see you out there on the campaign trail. Thank you so much.